Um, so just real quick on me, um, I'm a specialist solution architect for AWS. Um, I've been working for AWS for about two years. Um, I joined and focused on our marketplace partners, so any of the software vendors that were um, listing on the marketplace, interested in listing on the marketplace. I also worked with customers leveraging marketplace solutions. Um, for the Who's familiar with AWS Marketplace? Is anyone listed on AWS Marketplace in the room? A couple, almost, yeah. Yeah, Epsigon is, is, is getting there. Um, so uh, a few months ago, um, I switched to focus more on developer technology. So my, my background is in software development. I worked for a consultancy in the US before I moved to London. Um, I've worked across many, many industries, um, healthcare, retail, hospitality, security. Um, I also worked for Hewlett Packard for a few years, so um, enterprise software, um, I was on the Windows Server team there, so kind of a varied uh, varied history, but I'm, I'm really passionate about software development practices and DevOps cultures. Um, I say cloud native and DevOps on stage a lot, and that's pretty much what I do. Um, so why are we here today? Um, just re real quick, we all know what serverless is, yes? Hands up if you're using serverless in production today. Okay. Who's using it? Who's thinking about using it? Who's developing on it? Some more people? Okay. Um, and who's familiar with the 12-factor application framework? The, the, the idea is there. Okay. Most of you. Okay. So, uh, yes, serverless still, still does have servers, but the point of it is you don't have to manage them. Um, we, we do that for you. We offload that that heavy lifting, um, and that's kind of the philosophy of AWS: is the more that we can manage that you don't have to focus on, the better. Um, just real quick on the twelve factor model, um, it was popularized a few years ago by the guys at Heroku. Um, it's widely considered the best practice for modern application development today. Um, it pairs de developers and operations together. Um, and kind of codifies or, or standardizes that framework. Um, many of the 12 factors are handled for you by serverless or align very well with the best practices that we work with our customers on at Amazon. Um, there are some that either don't apply or we handle for you or kind of uh, are interpreted differently just because of the way that, that services are exposed. So we'll walk through them, but uh, that's kind of the 10 second summary. So this is from the 12factor.net website. If, you've, if, you, if you're familiar, you've probably seen this. Um, basically, the, the, the key takeaways is it's a methodology for building software as a service. Um, more and more our companies are realizing that that's the way to go, that that's how they see their product going forward. They can react quickly to customers, they can change in the market. Um, but, but there's some key takeaways that 12factor has. The first is using declarative formats, so infrastructure as code, making sure that new developers can get up to speed quickly. The more you reproduce the bootstrapping of your environment on a developer workstation and dev and test, the easier that's going to be in production. So that's, that's the first key. Um, having a clean contract with the underlying operating system. In the past, there was heavy reliance on um, maybe specific operating system implementations of file systems or... Uh, libraries like curl and those sorts of things. We'll talk about a bit about abstracting those away. Um, so making sure that you have a clean decoupled uh, contract with the operating system. They're suitable for deployment on cloud platforms. Um, I think it goes without saying that serverless is uh, born in the cloud technology, so that aligns very well. Um, there's minimum divergence between development, uh, development and production. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where I've I've said myself or heard teammates say, hey, it works on my machine, um, but it doesn't work in production because you've missed something. Um, so making sure that the test environments and the development environments are as close to production as possible is really important. And then scaling up without significant coding changes, configuration changes, making sure that it's ready for prime time. Um, a lot of the successful startups that you see today were, were very successful because they were able to scale so quickly. If they had had to you know, grow 10 times, 100 times overnight without the power of, of AWS and the public cloud, they, they probably would have had a much harder time scaling. So just a real quick overview on serverless. 
no service to provision. It's not, we don't think of serverless at AWS as just Lambda. We also think of things like DynamoDB or, or any of our managed services, Fargate is containers as a service. Um, serverless containers. We also recently launched um, a developer or a preview of uh, Aurora as a service. So you can use RDS um, in a serverless fashion. You, uh, you scale with usage, so you don't have to manage scaling at all, um, which is really great. There are obviously things to consider, as, as Epscon talked about. Um, and you never pay for idle, you pay for what you use. And we handle the availability and fault tolerance across our availability zones for you. So um, you focus on the code, you focus on the integrations, and we handle everything else. Uh, as far as serverless applications go, this is just a very basic slide. You have an event source. Um, they're, they're usually asynchronous and distributed. Um, and maybe it's a change to data. Maybe it's a, a request to a, an HTTP endpoint in a traditional fashion. Um, you can also do it based on changing resources. So if you have uh, workloads running uh, a distributed compute job, you can trigger you know, functions as a reaction to that. Then you have a function written in one of these languages, um, and those call out to uh, resources or services anywhere. Uh, these are some common, common Lambda use cases. I, do, I won't walk through all of these, but um, web applications is a perfect fit for it. You can have a static website served from S3 and any dynamism that you need can be calling out to a DynamoDB database and, and served by a Lambda function. It's a very, very cheap way to get something off the ground very quickly, um, all the way up to distributed real-time data processing, whether that's um, MapReduce jobs or, or large batch processing uh, integrating with some of our managed AI services. So let's kind of dig into the 12 factors. Um, these are, most of you are familiar, so I won't, I won't read through them all because we're going to dig into them anyway. But these are the ones, so we'll go through them one by one. So the first is the code base. Um, how many people can confidently say all of their code is tracked in version control today? Pretty good. How many people can say that all of their infrastructure is tracked in version control today? All of their infrastructure is code. Yeah, that's usually the response. <laughs> Not very many. Um, so. The more, the closer we get to true infrastructure as code, that becomes more and more important, right? You want your developers to be able to reproduce those environments. Again, we'll talk about that discrepancy a little bit later. But the key here is that all code, everything that's shared between developers, is managed in central version control. The other key is that you have uh, dependency management, which is the which is the next topic, but. As far as code bases go, you want to make sure that all of the applications in a distributed system have their own code base, have their own uh, self-management, and are, are interlinked with dependencies. Otherwise, you kind of break that this and the next, uh, the next process. So speaking of dependencies, that's the next, the next uh, piece of the framework. You really want to explicitly declare those and isolate them. So using things like NPM or NuGet, depending on your language, uh, packaging things up in a jar. Uh, the way that this works with serverless apps is very natural and native to this. Um, when you deploy a serverless function on AWS, <clears throat> there's a variety of ways you can do it depending on the language, but you're typically delivering a, a zip file or, or an executable. In, in Java, you can deliver a jar that has all the packages built together. Um, you can also integrate with things like Maven for Java, but the idea is that the artifacts and the dependencies are all handled in code and not at runtime. Uh, configuration is, is the next piece. You, from 12factor.net, they talk about storing the configuration in the environment. So abstracting all of the values of configuration from the code so that you can modify the environment without having to change the code. Um, there's a few ways that we do this in serverless applications on Lambda. The first is environment variables. So these are ac accessible in, a, in kind of a first class citizen way from key value pairs on the Lambda functions themselves. So those can be managed uh, per function. Um, we also have API gateway stages that can manage different environments and pass different flags to those functions. So the, the same function could process for different environments in different ways. It works really well for turning on feature flags for particular customers, for instance. And then we also have the AWS uh, parameter store, um, which is a way to manage and store your configuration data. 
the, the key here is that um, hierarchies are supported, so you can actually have an application, a stage, and, and then your, your features, and pull, use the same code to pull different configuration parameters for different environments, and you don't have to change the code at all. Um, you, you can have encrypted values in parameter store, you can use um, IAM credentials. It integrates really well with all of our services and is a simple answer to the configuration problem. Um, so I, I would really encourage you to look at that. Um, number four is backing services. So all of the services you rely on should be treated as attached resources instead of local resources. You should be able to swap out a local database for a, or for a MySQL database somewhere else without having to change the code, without impacting. Um, for a serverless, this is kind of handled for you. It's, it's everything that we, we talk to from a Lambda function is, is, a, is an attached resource. You're making an API call, it's, you're pulling a configuration and reaching out to another resource. There isn't really a state in Lambda. Yes, there is some reuse of containers, and many of you have probably seen that, but all of those endpoints that you're calling out to are managed completely separate from the function itself. You're not bootstrapping an entire environment or calling things locally or calling other functions locally. So this is, this is kind of handled for you. Works really well. The next is, is uh, all about releasing and building code. Um, all of these stages should be separate and there should be no back propagation. You shouldn't be changing things in production that then need to be propagated back to the build. You should always be building, releasing, and running in that order. Um, again, serverless applications, there's really no difference from the best practices in other, other platforms and frameworks. Traditional CI, CD pipelines should be followed as usual. Um, we have tools to support this. We also integrate very well with, with many other partners and tools in the market. Um, from our perspective, AWS code build is for building and then pipeline along with code deploy um, is for deploying. So if we take a look, just a quick example, at a serverless app, uh, this is a build spec YAML. How, how many people are using code build today? Oh, so this will be new to everybody. Um, so this is, this is a basic, um, very, very basic build spec. You can see the kind of the phases, so installation, installing dependencies, pre-build, build, and post-build. Anyone who's using CI, CD today on any platform, should, those should be familiar. And then we have the idea of uh, packaging up a cloud formation template for serverless, uh, uh, the service, uh, serverless application model, and then posting that to an S3 bucket somewhere. And then we also have the, the concept of artifacts, just like any build system. Um, when you deliver that code, we have a tool called Code Pipeline, um, which is is basically managing the entire CI/CD process. So you've got in this in this case you've got kind of a create change set for this is an infrastructure example. Create the change set for CloudFormation, execute that change set, and then run integration tests. Um, it's this is a pretty simple example, and I think we have I've got a couple more detailed ones, so I won't do this one to death. Yeah, here we go. Um, so um, this is a very, very simple, basically what you should start with. Um, you have your source code in AWS code commit. When you check a change in, it kicks off the build and then deploys it uh, to, a, to a particular area. Uh, once you add a minimal production pipeline, you'll have an additional staging environment. So once you're once your uh, stubs or Lambda functions have tested and validated things, it gets deployed to staging. You can run QA. Um, depending on if you're comfortable with automated deployments to production, um, that's kind of a hard, a hard uh, bridge to cross for a lot of people, but um, you can have a manual review process in code pipeline as well, and then you de deploy to production. So this is a very simple example. Um, it, we, have a, we have a command line tool called SAM which is, um, it's the serverless application model, and that command line tool actually has a bunch of examples of very simple to very, very complex CI CD pipelines that you can, you can deploy. So, um, yeah, we've got lots of options for this. Okay, so the next one is processes. Execute the app as one or more stateless processes. So, when you're thinking about serverless, that's kind of inherent to how we've designed functions as a service. You don't really do a lot of process forking, process management, worker thread spinoffs in, in a serverless application. 
if you're going to do that, it's going to be a distributed call to another system, um, another attached resources. Um, the important thing here is that everything should be treated as stateless. As I mentioned, you can do some clever things on startup as far as reuse of containers, but we never guarantee that the container is going to be uh, warm for you. So you should always be making sure that if you're if you need to connect to a database or you need to spin up a client, yeah, it might still be there if you've configured it in global state, but on the flip side of that, it may not be. So never, never make the assumption, always treat it as stateless and save things off to another database. Uh, exporting services as port binding. So this is the concept that you, you don't have, um, you shouldn't be having runtime injections of of server configurations in your in your code. Um, again, Lambda kind of goes against this a little bit. We don't, it's not a network exposed uh, service when you're running a Lambda function. Instead of a port, you've got one or more functions and one or more triggering services. So it's, it's a very different way of thinking of it from a traditional web application, uh, but it still works very well. Lambda can be triggered synchronously, asynchronously, or by streams. Uh, we also recently launched the ability to uh, trigger Lambda functions from a simple queue service. So uh, these are, it, it, it's, it's a different model, but it, it, it works really well for distributed systems, and you don't have to worry about any of that in your code is the key there. Any of the interdependencies between functions uh, will be treated as attached resources. So this is an example of, of kind of some of the execution models. You have a synchronous call, Let's say you're building a web service, Amazon API Gateway calls out to an order, executes a Lambda function, and returns a result. You also have asynchronous events. Maybe you're doing batch processing and you don't really care about the response just as long as the, the job was accepted. Um, you can trigger on S3, for example. So maybe you're uploading an image and then creating thumbnails of various sizes. That doesn't need to be a real-time job. It can be kicked off by by the S3 or, or a notification. And then you also have all of our streaming services like Amazon Kinesis. You can also uh, run streaming services from DynamoDB and all of those will be handled by a polling job that AWS Lambda handles for you. Uh, we have loads of event sources. Uh, this is just a small list of some of the things we integrate with um, and we're always adding more. Um, I don't think, yeah, SQS isn't on here but we just launched that recently. Um, so it's, it's really easy to integrate, integrate Lambda. Uh, concurrency is, is another piece, scale out via the process model. Again, we don't really think of processes. The scale is handled for you in Lambda. There's one, there's one concurrent execution per function, and then you can scale that out uh, as you need. Um, be careful how you do that, as we learned in the last talk, um, because there are... Uh, price uh, ramifications if you do too, too much scaling. But um, it, this is all handled for you, so it's not something that you have to think about in your code, which is really nice. It's, it's really simplified the way that you can do parallelized processing. Um, no, no more parallel for loops. Uh, disposability, startup and shutdown should be graceful. Again, startup is very important with Lambda. Uh, we see a lot of customers first uh, using Lambda and they they're spending a lot of time initializing resources every time. Maybe they, those could be abstracted into other systems and they'll spend you know, 60% of their processing time, which is 60% of their spend on AWS Lambda, spinning up something in their function. So startup is really important to, to um, optimize, but shutdown doesn't really matter. If things are stateless, when the job's done, will handle disposal of the, the container that Lambda's running in, and you don't really need to worry about it, which is, again, is, is really simplifies the way that you interact with it. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, dev prod parity. Um, I, I, again, can't, tell, can't count the number of times I've said it works on my machine, or it works in staging, or it works in test. Why isn't it working in production? Um, how, many, how many people have spent hours at night debugging a production issue that they never could have caught in a, in a lower tier environment. Yeah, there's a few of you. Um, there, one particular case uh, from one of my clients previously, we had, the, the way that we had, it was actually the test was better than production. We had a, a local database with no caching, no limits in, uh, in production 
that f we filled up a disk and it wasn't being monitored and it, we hit a max, a max size, but it was only on one of the nodes, so only you know, a quarter or an eighth of the, of the requests were failing. Um, we never would have caught that in, in test just because we were using a central DB for that. Um, again, make use, make use of those environment or stage variables. Use parameter store. Use these tools that we make available for you for handling that configuration. The nice thing about serverless is, we were actually talking about this a bit earlier, the functions are free. You're not, you're not paying anything for the number of functions you have, you're paying for the implications. So you can actually stand up functions for every developer, functions for every team, whatever you need. Um, some of the integration environments are harder to replicate, but um, if you use our serverless application model, it's really easy to, to stand up those environments per developer and make everything like for like dev to production. Also, using CI CD is really, really important. If you can stand it up on your machine quickly, you can make changes or stand up a new prod environment and scale very quickly. Uh, I've talked a little bit about it, but um, just want to give a brief overview of SAM. Uh, it's a serverless application model. So it's a cloud formation extension, and we do all the transformations for you. So it makes serverless functions, APIs, tables, all those sorts of things, first class citizens. And then we'll do the transformation to Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB on the back end. Um, and it's also an open specification. Um, I also mentioned we have the SAM CLI, which you can start playing probably within 10 minutes. It's a Python library. Um, you can install it very quickly. It will generate an entire basic template. And then we also have complex examples of CI CD pipelines, applications that are more complicated than a to do list. But the basic the basic uh, template here, up here at the top, this is telling CloudFormation that you, this is a SAM template. So this is saying, interpret this as SAM and transform it into CloudFormation. Uh, then this section is creating a, a Lambda function uh, with all the options and available there. Here's the code artifact, um, all of the runtime environments, anything that you need there. And then this will actually create a DynamoDB table. So this is, I don't know, probably 100 lines less than you would do it in CloudFormation, which is, is really powerful. Um, and then you have the kind of Lambda and API gateway side, which is, uh, if you look on the, the right, we're kind of explaining all the environment. Uh, we've got different allowed values, so you can, you can easily deploy to testing stage or prod. Probably should lock prod down for your developers. Um, and then also just kind of built in, built in tagging um, all that sort of stuff. So Sam is really powerful. Uh, that alongside with a new, who's heard of the cloud development kit? Nobody. Oh, very exciting. So this alongside our cloud development kit, which is in developer preview today, um, really changed the way that you can do infrastructure. It's no longer specifying every, every single piece of infrastructure in a long, long template. You can specify higher level constructs like an API or a function um, in in either YAML with SAM, or the Cloud Developer Kit is actually native languages. So you can use .NET, you can use Java, you can use TypeScript, we're working on Python. Um, and you can actually stand up very complex architectures with code. So we're getting more closer and closer to that, that true infrastructure as code. Uh, the other cool thing about SAM, I, I think I heard someone earlier say that debugging SAM, or debugging Lambda sucks. It, it has historically, um, but you can actually do offline testing. Um, the genesis of this tool was one of our essays that I work with closely. Um, actually was flying back and forth to Seattle a lot and wanted to test Lambda functions on the plane, so uh, he started building this and now it's kind of a full-fledged service. Um, so the, the 11th one is logs. Uh, treat logs as event streams. Uh, don't manage log files, don't manage uh, when they get turned over, all of this should be handled um, as an event stream. In traditional 12-factor applications, that means writing to standard out, um, which is basically what you do in Lambda. Anything that gets logged gets logged to CloudWatch, and we handle all of that for you. Um, you can also write to things like X-Ray. You can write to third-party tools. Um, it's, it, it, very, it greatly simplifies the way that, that things are, are working, uh, but it is important 
to, to keep tracing in mind, to keep all those interactions in mind. X-ray covers some things, but we have partners that cover um, a great deal more. So, so keep in mind that when you have a distributed system, logging and tracing is really important. Um, the last one is uh, admin processes. So this is the idea that all of these processes should be kind of one-off. They shouldn't be something that you have to do every time. When you're deploying to production, you shouldn't be logging into the server and copying and pasting DLLs. Yes, I've done that. Um, it, it should be something that's automated. Management of these things should be one-off when you see an issue and everything else should be automated. Again, Lambda, we handle all of the scaling, all of the uh, behind the scenes administrative tasks for you because you're not managing any of the servers. So if you're handling build, run, release, and all of the CI, CD stuff, um, it should be very, very simple to, to meet this one. Uh, so this is kind of a summary of what we've gone through. Uh, so some of the process and port binding and concurrency are not relevant or different, but many, many of the, the 12 factor applications framework design can uh, work really well with serverless. Uh, in closing, think about code reusability. That's one thing we're focusing a lot on and we've heard loud and clear from developers. How do we build environments like for like in different stages, in different regions, in different areas and availability zones? So we're, we're really focusing on that in our, our developer tools. Things like SAM, things like CDK are, are coming out um, and we're working on them uh, very closely with developers. Also, if you're using serverless and you're following our best practices, if you've followed things like the well-architected framework and the serverless lens, you're probably really close to, to 12 factor, um, the 12 factor bar, if you will. So it, it, they will go really well hand in hand. Um, for more information, there's a serverless page on our website and then there's also serverless developer tools. So this is where you'll find information about CI/CD integrations, SAM local, uh, testing, all that stuff. Thank you.